I spent a little bit more time and came in and added this one additional figure. So you can see now I've made this composition out of the first mass, that's an array of 12, a second mass, which was an array of 9, and this third mass, which is an array of 8. Here, I've moved everything over 15 feet, and I've hatched each of those different objects with a different style of hatch. I've got blue, purple, and orange. This is just for me to see the potentials of those figures. I then copy that line work over, hide the hatches, which you can do again, SEL hatch. If we select hatch, you can just hide the hatches. So I can copy this figure over 15 feet, and that's where it sits over there. I'm not going to do that. Because I've hidden the hatches, I can use the show command to show the hatches again. In this figure, this kind of completed aggregated figure, I've trimmed all those different parts so that we end up with one single solid hatch. To do that, I deleted this. I created a layer called resultant figure. I can grab all of this stuff, right click, change object to layer, and then making sure that this is the active layer, grab it again, use the hatch command, and I can say that I want it hatched in the layer color, which I set to red. This was our first kind of pass in Rhino to create kind of baseline wireframe geometry, then hatch each of the independent figures, and then ultimately Boolean and trim uh, each of those figures so that we have one solid hatchable zone. We now need to move this from a production software, Rhino, into a graphics or representation software, which is Adobe Illustrator. On Owlbox, everyone will have access to this file, and we're gonna cover Illustrator very briefly now. Um, when you open Adobe Illustrator, which is free for all Temple students, all Adobe Creative Cloud is, you'll see that we have some tools on the left-hand side. We'll be working a lot with the selection tool and the direct selection tool. We also might be using some text. There's ways to make lines, rectangles. There's lots of options here. Down here is one important part. When I see here, I have the fill color and the stroke color. And what that means is, say, I click on this object, my stroke color is red. Red is set up so that it's the outline color. If I click here on that stroke color, I can change it. Let's change it to blue using the color tab here. If you don't see any of this stuff, you can go up to Window, Arrange, uh, sorry, Workspaces, and use Essential Classics. This is what I know best, and this is what works well most of the time. You can use Essential Classics, and you'll have a very similar layout as you see here. By changing the stroke color, you can see now that line work is set to blue. If I needed to, I could also change the fill color. This is the fill color here, so I click that box, and I could set a color for the fill. Now that box is filled in. Using Edit Undo, I can undo it twice, and we're back to where we started. A few other things to look at. If I go to Windows, I can look at Layers. I can also click this Layer button here. And you see that the guide has been set up. This template that's been given to you has layer one, which is some text information here, and guide. I'm going to rename this so when it comes to you, this will just be our baseline layer. The guides on top of this are just placeholders for where those objects are going to go. So we're going to export the object from Rhino and put it here as the resultant figure. We're also going to do the overlaid line work and the hatched line work so that we can see all three of these things. Moving forward, we may use these scale figures to show the size of any section, plan, elevation, just to get a sense of how big or small that thing is. Let's take a look at what else is in here. If I use Control Plus to zoom in, I could actually also use the zoom tool here. I can click and drag to zoom in or out on an object. I can hold down the space bar in Illustrator to pan. It's a really easy way to kind of get around. I'm going to go back to the direct selection tool. And maybe this is a good time to take a look at the direct selection, or the, this is the selection tool and the direct selection tool. The direct selection tool lets me grab specific parts of geometry, say that vertex, and move it somewhere else. Obviously, I don't want to do that, but with just the selection tool, I end up moving the entire piece of geometry. I can also scale and stretch things, but it's best to kind of make sure that we're doing everything uh, dimensionally in Rhino before we bring it here. What we need you to do is to fill out this kind of information, right? What is this image? What does it show? Why is it interesting? 
talk a little bit about why this composition is interesting to you. What is it? Is it the sharpness, the crispness? Is it the complex overlays? Is it the slipping? You can find a way to describe what that resultant figure is and why you want to work with it. Down here, we also need to put your name uh, first and last. This will be spring uh, 19 and professor first and last name. So that'll be your instructor. And this right now is set to page one of three. Ultimately, we're asking you to create three different compositions that look at three different groupings of Rhino drawings. So the easy way to do that is to create three additional sheets. So the template you get will just be the single one, but what everyone will need to do is to go to File, Document Setup, Edit Artboards, create a new letter artboard by creating this here. You can see the artboard is the white piece of paper there. So I click new and there's a second one and new again, and there's a third one. I can then go back to the selection tool and see everything by holding spacebar using control minus to zoom out. Now I can grab all of this stuff that's both on guides and baseline. I can copy it and I can go to edit paste on all artboards then it shows up everywhere. When I look at this stuff here, I can see that it's because I pasted it into the guides, everything is on the guide layer. And I set this up so guides don't print. So the last thing you'll need to do to set up your pages is to make sure that these objects here are all on the baseline layer. And to do that, I'll just drag this little node down to baseline. You can see now their outlines turn blue to show me that they're on the baseline layer. Similar, we'll make sure all this stuff here is on the baseline layer. There it is. I can double click the guides layer, which will bring up the layer options. And you can see I have it set so that it will not print. We're using these boxes to show a place of where your images need to be sat, but we don't want those boxes to print. So if I turn off the guides layer, this is what we'll ultimately see with your Rhino drawings embedded in it. I'm gonna go ahead and send everyone this template with all three pages and to make it a little bit easier. And we'll change these page numbers by clicking into the text box. It knows that I'm editing text. So spring 2019, oh, it's not 2019 anymore. Change that so it's spring 2020. 2020 and 2020. Let's jump back over to Rhino and look at how we export drawings into Illustrator. All right, so here in Illustrator, we're able to actually send this stuff out as an export and it remembers all of the lines that we're using. So if I grab everything that I'm working on in this composition, I can actually just use the export command. Now, the thing to remember is that we made this composition in feet. And now I'm going to go to Temple, Spring 20, and I'm going to send this out as an Adobe Illustrator file. So you can see here, I can export an Adobe Illustrator file, .ai. But Rhino's smart enough to know that if I name something and then add .ai, it will do it. So this is 2D overlay version 1.ai. That's an Adobe Illustrator file. So I can say save. It now asks me a few options. Do I want to export a snapshot of the current view or preserve the model scale? It's really critical that in architecture, we always work at a scale. And because we're using quarter inch scale, what I can say is that four feet equals one inch. Conversely, I can say one feet equals a quarter of an inch. I don't need to export viewport boundaries for this. Hatches are exported as solid fills. I can order the layers. This all seems fine. So I'll say, okay, it has exported that file now. And in Illustrator, I can go open it. So here's overlay version two. You can see that all of these objects show up on my canvas. My canvas is roughly my screen size. And it's important to know that this first point was my zero, zero, zero in Rhino. If in Rhino you're working with objects that are very, 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 very far away and some that are down by the origin, if we export this, there's a chance that these objects will not show up on our artboard. I'm going to edit undo and bring everything back where it was. But here, what you can see is everything that I had made in Rhino shows up as layers in Illustrator. 
So I can go in and turn off everything except for the guide. That was my first box. Then I have my lines, my option A, my option A1, A2, and then ultimately my ultimate figure down there. We do not want these compositions to be done in color. So the first thing I'm going to do is to grab everything and I'm going to set their stroke color to be black. So the stroke color is just the line color. I'll click the black and now you can see if I zoom in, everything is a dark black figure. Let's grab everything again. Here on the right hand side, you can see there's a stroke menu. If you don't have that, you can go down to window and window and stroke right here. And what that does is bring up our line weight controls. Right now, let's just set everything to be 0.25 line weight, a very, very thin line. When I click off of it again, you can see it's much easier to understand. Here on the left-hand side where we have everything overlaid, it's really very complex. And using a little bit of line weight will help us understand where those differences come in. I'm gonna grab these two sets of objects here, go up to object, lock, selection. This way I can't actually edit these things. And going back to my layers, I can lock my guides and lines just that way I can focus on editing these objects within this line weight uh, overlay. So option A, if I click this little circle, it'll select everything on option A. Because I've locked these two other things, I'm not editing those. So let's go in and change option A's line weight to be one point. Those are our major lines. Now I can go back in and click uh, option 1A. I can make sure that I have nothing selected and click the little circle again next to the layer. And there's 1A. This time I'm going to grab this and make it 0.75. Lastly, I'll grab uh, option 2 and make this 0.5. If I zoom in now, I can see that those different line weights help me understand. But I think maybe option A is a little too heavy. So I'll go back in, grab option A, and I'm also going to set that to 0.5. Finally, I'm going to turn off the grids and guides and just have those overlaid lines. While that's pretty complex to look at and difficult to see, I can understand here how those things worked. And lastly, I can see my aggregated figure here. I'm going to go to Object, Unlock All to get everything back. And I'm going to work to try to just get this outline here. That's a hatch line. I'm looking to zoom in using Control Plus to grab this outline. This line isn't continuous. And I can see here it's on the resultant figure layer. So let's go ahead and turn off everything else by using the eyeball, turning off those layers. You can see here is only the resultant figure. This object, we'll check a look. This is 0.25. And when I zoom in, I'm worried that I'm going to get the exact same 0.25. The hope was that I'd be able to go all the way around and get all of these lines to be thicker and the hatch to be thinner. But that's just not the case. If I grab everything right now, I can set this to 0.5, but then my hatch is very, very, very thick. I could manually go in and grab each one of those hatch lines, but I might as well just go ahead and export that piece one more time. So I'll delete this, I'll go to uh, Rhino. I'm gonna zoom in and use the command we used before, select hatch and hide. Then all of these lines, I'm gonna to work to join them. So now when I click one line, I get everything else. We also have these interior lines, but for the most part, this will make my job much easier. I'll type show in Rhino to bring everything back. I'll grab that object, I'm gonna export overlay version one, but this is just my resultant figure. So I need to rename that file. I'll save, I'll keep all the settings from before and say okay. Then in Illustrator, I'll open that new resultant file. There it is. I'll do what I did before and grab everything, click my stroke, double click my stroke and set it to black. I can also go up to the color and grab the black color there. I'm going to grab everything again and set it to 0.25. Then I'm going to use Control Plus to zoom in. I'm going to grab that outside line and set it to 0.5, a very heavy line. I can grab the inside line, 
and the two kind of islands, the things contained inside, and set them to 0.5. Now that I've made those edits here, I can grab everything you see on the screen. I can say Control C to copy it. I can move it back into this file, but I want to paste it on the resultant figure layer. So I'll turn everything on. I'll make sure that this layer is selected, and I'll go Edit, Paste in Place. This way it's in the exact same location as it was before. Looks a little red when we're zoomed out. So now with these three figures, I'm going to move them into my template. So let's do that one at a time. I'll close this one. I'll save the changes. It says the resultant figure, save and replace. I'll say OK. It'd be smart of me to save this file too, just so if I have any errors, it doesn't crash and we have to redo it. So we'll save it as the overlay version one. Yes. OK. And now I'm going to grab these objects and move them over. So let's just grab everything. Uh, we can actually be smarter about this. I'm going to grab one at a time. So this will be copy. And here in the overlay template on my first example, I'm using the line work and the explanation. Spell check's important. And I've updated that to be spelled correctly. So here I have my guides in my baseline. But in my template file, I'm going to create a new layer. And this layer is going to be line work overlay version one. I'm going to lock these other layers so I can't edit them. And on this layer, I'll paste that first piece. I'll then drag it and you can see it should snap into the center of that rectangle. Because this is made up of different pieces, I could actually go in and group that. So let's drag everything here. Because I have those layers locked, I'm only selecting my line work. And I'll use Control G to group it. This way, when I click one piece, it's everything you see. So let's see. There we go. That should be the center. Uh, there we go. That should be the center of the rectangle. If I turn off the guides, you can see I'm left with just that piece. Let's go make our next layer and call this overlay hatch version one. Again, I'll lock a layer, make sure that this is uh, my active layer. I'll grab everything here and use Control G to group it. I'll copy it. And then here, hatch line work, Control Paste. I'm going to move this here into the center right there. The final step is to grab the entire aggregated figure. I'll group it, copy it, and then move it. And I'm going to create a new layer, resultant figure, lock this layer, paste, and move this one into the center of this rectangle. Then I can turn off my guides, and I'm left with one of the first layouts. This is the process of going through and making these things. And it's important to know that we're working at scale, right? Everything that we've done here is measured out at a quarter inch equals a foot. So if I ever needed to measure a portion of this, I would know the true size of it as if I was going to 3D print it. For assignment one, part one, everyone will need to make compositions using at least three sets of curves, hatch those curves, and then create these layouts, coming in and explaining what it is about these layouts that you think is most interesting. This goes back to the size of the scale. When we started this, we said that we should be somewhere between five by five, maybe eight by eight, if you really need to go to a different dimension, you can talk to your instructor. But the reason we're asking to stay at that size is that ultimately we need to make sure that these work on this layout and that we can 3D print them.